Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner, available for code reviews, contracting, and on-site training. So in this episode, I want to briefly cover operator overloading in C++. I don't believe I have mentioned that at all yet in C++ Weekly, but I have been doing this for a while, so anything is possible. It is possible that I have done it and I have forgotten about it. But we're going to do another episode, or a first episode. Now, I know m many languages do not allow operator overloading. They only allow prescribed operator overloading. C++ allows us to overload almost every operator. Not every operator, but almost every one. Ah, oh, that's right. I have done an episode in the past about why you should never overload the um, logical and or logical or um, operators. So you can go and look at that if you want to. But I want to do a relatively quick intro. Now, if I've got some sort of struct, let's call it, uh, what shall we call it? I'm just going to call it data. We're going to say that this is a thing called data. And it's got two pieces of value here. Now, um, I know I'm going to do this. I'm just going to do a quick implementation of a complex number, I guess. So we've got both the real and the imaginary part of our complex number. And this is a very like normalish thing to do. If I've got a complex number, I might want to add another complex number to it. Something like this. Now, the compiler can't generate this for us, but ooh, our current version of GCC gives us this really pretty output that tells us exactly what went wrong. It doesn't know how to add these two things together because there is no match for an operator plus. So I can define an operator plus. And it can be just this simple. Now, um, there are like three different ways to create an operator like this, particularly a operator that takes two parameters, a binary operator. And the, this is one, it can be created as a free function. Now, part of the problem with creating it as a free function is if I needed to access private data in order to do this, say if our complex implementation looked something like this, then um, this code can't compile this operator plus down here can't compile because it can't access the private numbers of this. Now, now granted, this is a little bit silly of implementation because I would need to provide access to those things. So uh, the other option is to create a function like this. And the left-hand side is implicitly going to be the current object, and the right-hand side is going to be the object that is passed into me. So I can do this. And this LHS now becomes just R, or this arrow R, or something like that. So there we go, I can create it as, as a member function as well. Now the compiler is not showing us any code here for this member function because it doesn't need to, it can do that. Now the problem with this one is if somehow your code relies on automatic conversions, then they cannot come into play. So if, for example, I did just this version, let's see if I can do... If I want to create one with just the real component, and I'm sure someone will have some comment about how I'm implementing complex incorrectly, but that's not really the point at the moment, then this is implicitly convertible 
from a double. Now, if I wanted to do this, if I wanted to do C plus 4.5, I can do that. Because it is going to find the implicit conversion here, which is allowed by this single parameter constructor that is not marked explicit. And then it is going to automatically convert that to a complex. And in the process, it is going to call this plus operator overload that I have here. Now where this interestingly falls down is if I wanted to do 4.5 plus C, this code can't compile because the function that it is given is one that is on a complex object and expects a complex. I don't have a complex object on the left hand side, I have a double. So it can't find this operator overload. So then the next option for creating a binary operator overload for a user defined type is to define it like this. It is a free function specified inside the body of the class. Now this isn't compiling. It isn't compiling because this doesn't make sense from a C++ perspective. This operator plus should only take one parameter. If I declare it a friend function, it is now a free function that is declared friend and in line has access to the private members and all of the implicit conversions can come into play. So now this code does exactly what we were hoping it would do. Now, of course, best practices generally say that this should be explicit. Maybe it's not true in all cases. And also, um, this is a very trivial type, which clearly should be const expert. And as long as we are talking about it, we should probably also mark the return of our plus operator overload as no discard. And if I just get it in the correct order. Ah, there we go. So this is a no discard friend const expert complex free function declared inline in our struct. Now, that's all very good and interesting. This is the basis of why we have operator overloading in C++ so that we can define user-defined types that look and act like built-in types. And that, that is entirely the goal. And for many things, this makes a lot of sense. You do have to be very careful to make sure that you provide operator overloads that make sense in the domain. If they don't make sense in your domain, then your coworkers and the people who read your code later are very much not going to like you. So I'm going to throw this away. And we're going to talk about another operator overload right now. I'm just going to create my dumb pointer here but it is a pointer wrapper and it is a pointer wrapper around an int that is my p that data is private in fact no i guess we won't make the data private fine now if i want this thing to actually behave like a pointer i need to provide an operator arrow overload that looks like this It returns an int pointer. This is a unary operator. It doesn't make sense to make this a free function or a friend function or anything like that, just to find this thing in line 99% of the time. And this is also something that could be const expr. Now we have decisions to make. We have decisions about const versus non-const versions of this. Now we're going to get a, uh, there we go. So if I make this const, I can return a non-const reference to my data member even in a const member function. And this is in fact how shared pointer and unique pointer are implemented. But this is just a quick example
I'm creating a pointer to this dumb pointer. I am initializing the P here. And then I can do something like, actually, to make this example make sense, I need to include a more complex type. And interestingly, if I had made these auto, then I wouldn't have to worry about changing the type now. And this is a pretty handy use of auto in my opinion. Could also have made this a templated type. There, so I can do something like this. I can cre uh, create my dumb pointer as if it was actually a pointer to a standard string. And that does um, exactly what we would expect it to do. It calls the size member function on our s, which is stored here as a pointer inside the dumb pointer object. So there you go. That's a brief primer on operator overloading in C++. Please, please do operator overloads that make sense in your domain. Be very careful with this. Do not just randomly overload every operator that you possibly can. That does not make sense. C++ does not work well with that. Programming does not work well with that. So thanks for watching this episode of C++ Weekly.